Welcome to another episode of Preparing for the Unexpected. I'm your host, Alex Fullick, and as always, we like to talk about things related to disaster management, emergency management, business continuity, COVID, resilience, well-being, anything that helps you, your organization, or your community prepare for, respond to, and overcome adverse situations. If there's a topic you'd like us to talk about on the show, please feel free, reach out on LinkedIn, you can find me. I'm the only Alex Fullick there, so I'm really easy to find. And let me know uh, if you want to be on the show or you'd like us to talk about a specific topic. I do respond to everything I get. A couple of other quick announcements. I will be speaking at a couple of conferences later this year. October 4th and 5th, I will be at the Continuity Insights Conference in Minneapolis. Hopefully, I can travel, uh, and that'll be uh, in person. Uh, And the next one in November, 3rd and 4th, is the BCI World Virtual Conference. And then I'm speaking in Toronto, December 1st and 2nd, at the Continuity and Resilience Today Conference. So hopefully I can run into uh, some of you uh, there, assuming that we're all on site, of course. Now, I said at the beginning of the show, if there's uh, something you want to talk about, to reach out. And today's guest did that. So... You, you, you will get on the show if you, uh, you reach out to me. I want to welcome to the show today, Emily Jane Zaradine. Emily Jane, welcome. Hi, Alex. It's great to be here. Thanks for reaching out. You know, you're proof that I do respond to everything, and you know, I'm more than happy to have people come on the show. Great. Now, uh, we've got viewers and listeners uh, literally around the globe in many different countries. Can you take a couple of minutes and just tell us about yourself, what you do and how you got into this um, uh, emergency management topic that we'll be touching on shortly? Absolutely. I've been in emergency management for almost about nine and a half, almost 10 years. It'll be 10 years soon. Um, I started working for a nonprofit uh, in the Washington DC area. And one of my assignments was to complete some continuity planning of continuity of all things, right? It's it's not the first place you think, you know, a future emergency manager gets sort of access into the field necessarily, but that was my journey in. I was asked to put together 13 different plans. We had 13 different facilities, each on different military installations. And they were run by different branches of the United States military. So they had different policies, different protocols, different everything. Um, different terminology for the exact same thing, you know, and that's just some of the differences between our military branches, right? Um, But that's sort of where I got the bug. And from there, I transitioned um, into working in emergency management full time. Um, I've worked for the House of Representatives. I've worked for FEMA headquarters in their National Continuity Programs Directorate, which was one of the highlights of my careers. Um, I never understood how much goes into government continuity until I really had the chance to see up close and personal what all of the United States government, federal departments and agencies are responsible for doing on a regular basis to make sure that they're fully prepared and and can handle all different types of continuity operations um, and to ensure that they can maintain our constitutional form of government under all circumstances. Um, from, from my time at FEMA, I transitioned into local government, which is where I really fell in love with the, the boots on the ground version of emergency management. Mm-hmm. Um, I worked for Arlington, Virginia for several years. Um, in that role, uh, I ultimately was the program manager for preparedness. So I oversaw everything in training and exercises and in planning that Arlington County government did for emergency preparedness. Um, And from there, I sort of said to myself, you know, I love this work. I love emergency management, but I really want to see what the private sector has to do with this and how we can connect with the private sector better. Um, There was a report that came out, I think, in the last year, but I've seen it in the news several times in the last few days about how for every six dollars of money or excuse me, every dollar of money spent on mitigation efforts by the United States government, they saved six dollars in response and recovery money. That's incredible. And I think mm-hmm. that the private sector has a 
has the opportunity and even a right to get in on some of those savings. You know, I know governments are responsible for taking care of their communities, but there are communities within organizations and within companies. And my goal and my effort and really what I'm driving towards is helping those businesses and, and, and not the Disney's or the Walmart's of the world, the smaller companies, but still may have a few thousand employees who can be more well-prepared to take care of themselves and their families and can be more well-prepared to come back into work and either support the business to make sure everybody still gets a paycheck and everybody still has health insurance or to come back into the community and help the greater community as a whole when they're responding to or recovering from a disaster. And so that is sort of the the arc of my story in emergency management in a nutshell, I guess. Lots of experience, lots of uh, different groups you've been working with. I'm looking forward to this chat now to see what uh, other things you can bring forward and share with us. Yeah, now, the first thing I know that we're going to talk about is e- EMGI, Emergency Management Growth Initiative. Yes. What is that? Can you tell us about that? Absolutely. So uh, EMGI is a nonprofit organization that was started last spring by Lorraine Schneider. She is currently the crisis manager for Disney. Uh, This is her brainchild. Um, And it it started at the beginning of the pandemic and it has just grown since then. So the organization is really focused on advancing diversity and inclusion within the field of emergency management. And so there are a variety of initiatives that the organization is undertaking right now. Um, The one I'm most familiar with is the one that I'm leading, which is the Innovation Hubs Initiative. And what's the Innovation Hub? So, so the, the goal of the innovation hubs is to craft the most diverse and inclusive definition of emergency management. And we want that new definition. What's what's wrong with the old one? Oh, um, it depends on who you ask. In my opinion. Sorry, let's take a step back even further. What's the, what is the current definition of emergency management? You don't have to be word for word, but the, sure. the, the current definition of emergency management and what is it missing? Certainly. So I'm not going to answer that so much, but let me redirect to get to sort of the same area. So in 2006, FEMA worked with, um, and I'm going to give you an acronym, Sue, here because I don't know all of the acronyms, but they worked with NEMA, they worked with IAEM um, and a few other organizations. And there was a, a definition that was produced that really sort of sidelined emergency managers as, as I want to say as project managers, but later on in this part of our discussion here is for me also to say, well, we did think through it and we still are project managers. So The original definition that came out in 2006, we said at at EMGI, my conversations with Lorraine, we said, we don't think that's necessarily a bad definition, but can we do better? Mm. We don't need to throw the baby with the bathwater out, but let's just see what we can do better. So we designed a four-week program. So we meet for two hours each week. We meet on Saturdays. um, And we have about 15 to 18 participants in our Innovation Hub program. So over each week, we focus on different themes. And so I I went and I I read a bunch of articles and watched some videos and tried to immerse myself and really understand how the corporate world does innovation, right? There's the like, I, I have like a mental image of IBM or other really big companies putting a bunch of consultants and thinkers in a room with a bunch of, you know, a lot of post-its, a lot of whiteboard pens, and just sort of saying, solve this problem. Go, go crazy. I have seen that many, have many, you? many times. Oh, walk okay. past rooms. You know, they call it agile project management, but, you know, sometimes you just see all these post-it notes and just go, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> Exactly. No, exactly. And so I wanted to, because we have to do this in a virtual environment, I wanted to find a way to really structure the conversation. So the four themes that are sort of the defining pillars of innovation or of an innovation hub program is discovery, creation, development, and refinement. So for the first week, we focused on discovery. And that was really framing the problem. So during our two hour virtual session that I facilitated, we talked through a whole variety of different questions of sort of what are we and what are we not? 
you know, are we command and control or are we coordination and communication? Mm -hmm. Right. So that was one of the conversations that we had that was really, really insightful. Um, Week two, we, the focus was creative. It was creation and creativity. And so we, what I tried to do is push the participants to consider if you were in a different emergency management sector, what would your job responsibilities be? Or what would your core capabilities or your, you know, your core requirements for the job? What would those be? So if you're a local public schools emergency manager, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of an aviation emergency manager or some, you know, if you're a, if you're a FEMA emergency manager, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of a local government emergency manager and really start to conceptualize the field from there. Mm-hmm. So after the first two weeks, I sent out essentially a summary of the notes. And then for the third week, we talked through all of those notes. And so we, we have a lot of findings. We have one more week to go that's coming up this Saturday. And that's where we're going to craft and really refine the, a potential future definition we'd like to consider. But the findings we had are really, really interesting. And I would love the opportunity to drop into those with you now. I know I'm preempting your questions, good, but I'm good. on a roll here right. and I want to keep going. <laughs> I know, and I, I don't want to cut you off. <laughs> By defining emergency management, are you defining the profession of industry management or are you defining the role of an uh, emergency management profession or both? Great question. I think it's more of the role of an emergency manager. Um, I know that the International Association of Emergency Managers, IAEM, they are doing a survey to identify the, I think, core competencies that you would want in a great emergency manager. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they're doing that work. uh, And I think that's more based on the, the sort of job description or the ideal candidate. Whereas we're trying to say, okay, there are a lot of people who could help. Let me say, let me say this. We're not saying this. I'm saying this. I'm saying there are a lot of people in our community who could really, really help during a disaster. And I want to find a way to incorporate them and to bring them into the process. And for me, the first step in that process is defining emergency management in a more inclusive way. So we can help identify all the people who really are emergency managers, but might be dual hatted. And so the example I give for this is sort of like social services or public works. The people who lead those government departments are not, you know, full-time emergency managers, but they absolutely are emergency managers when a big enough emergency happens. They have that role and they need Mm -hmm. to roll into those operations. That's true. Yes. So how did this come about though? How Um, did this whole change in thinking come about like what if it's being run by uh, uh, sorry you mentioned the name um lorraine from disney what happened at uh lorraine's end um potentially for her to stand up and say hey we need to make a change was there something that occurred um the picking the topic was something that is a little bit selfish from my side i think um It was not originally my idea. It was a group idea to do redefining emergency management as the topic for the first innovation hub. And for me, the reason it it really worked is I just moved. I moved from Washington, D.C. to Denver. And in Washington, D.C., everyone's inside the beltway and and knows all the acronyms or, you know, at least can fake it for a few minutes while you have a conversation. (laughs) But in Denver, it's just not a government, it's not a company town. It's not a government-based town in the way that DC is. Um, and so I've had to explain myself and sort of what I do um, in a more dynamic way than I've ever had to before. And I, I really want to be really accurate and really clear with people when I tell them about what I do, partially because I'm passionate about it and partially because I'm actually just super passionate about it. And I'm trying to evangelize to everyone to build their own personal preparedness kit. So that is how sort of the the challenge of how do I really define myself concisely? That's how that sort of that kernel came up. And then we just sort of extended it and grew from there. And and how about um, the, the start of the MGI? That was your start. But how did you get involved with it? How did you come across it? Did I actually know to jump in. I did not know Lorraine. I had never met her. Um, I 
found it on LinkedIn and it seemed really interesting. Oh, yeah. One of the first initiatives they did um, that they still do are these um, emergency dinner, emergency talk dinners. So it's about 18 to 20 emergency managers. It's They're usually on weekend evenings um, and everyone can sort of bring whatever they want to eat or drink. And it's, it's a virtual dinner with a different theme on it each night. We did one theme that was the future of emergency management and how we would define emergency management. Um, we went through that prior to designing this program because we really wanted to mine the participants for good data to help us really set this program up um, and to make sure that we're providing good value to the participants as well. Oh. Well, on that note, we've come to the end of our first segment. We are talking today with Emily Jane Zaradine, Zaradine sorry, uh, on emergency management, and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Today, we are talking with Emily Jane Zaradine, and we are talking about emergency management. Great first segment, Zara, uh, Emily Jane. We had uh, lots of, uh, well, obviously, it's going to be clear to anybody watching and listening. You're very passionate about this. It's very clear. Um, Thank you. I'm surprised I, I, you know, I have questions for you because I, I could just sit here and, okay, off you go. <laughs> you, know, you, have, you have lots to say, which is fantastic. I really like that. Thank you. You talked about uh, Innovation Hub, and you mentioned four uh, key areas or key parts of it, um, discovery, create, develop, and, and uh, refine. Can you look at those in a little bit more uh, or go into those with a little bit more in depth? What do you mean by um, discovery? So for discovery, I really wanted to create a great community around this project around the innovation hubs. And so I wanted to really make sure that all of our participants, and we have participants all over the United States, as well as some in Canada, um, we have a wide age range. We have a pretty good gender breakdown. Um, and what I wanted to do with all these participants who, who don't know each other, or maybe do pro, you know professionally, tangentially, but you know they're not friends, they don't have a interpersonal relationship. I wanted to really start from the same point from the same jumping off point into the concept. So I wanted us to really consider innovation um, in a more classic content, or excuse me, more classic um, concept. So there is a Harvard Business Review uh, article about Kodak. And so it's a case study about how Kodak kind of missed the opportunity to innovate. They had pretty much all the pieces they needed to create their own version of Facebook, and they didn't put all the pieces together. They didn't line it up. It didn't click, didn't catch fire, if you will. Um, and so we looked at that as an opportunity to sort of say, they were not agile, the term you used before talking about innovation hubs. They were not agile. They were not reactionary. And they, they just didn't take the opportunity to really assess the landscape. And that's what I wanted to do with the discover phase of the innovation hubs is to really say, all of you come from such different emergency management backgrounds and even more complex and diverse professional backgrounds. Not everyone has just been an emergency manager. We have smartest, we have former law enforcement, um, mm -hmm. we have students who are fantastic additions to the group. So I wanted to make sure that we all got on the same page um, and we all started to explore the concept of what the best definition for emergency management may be from the same starting point. And we really did that with the Kodak article from, as I said before, the Harvard Business Review case study. It's so interesting you mentioned Kodak because it, it, if I'm not mistaken, they were also um, hesitant with regards to digital cameras. Yes, they were. And that that was another thing, you know, they uh, shied away from, I guess. Absolutely. No. And, and that's covered in the case study. They, I believe they were the first to develop essentially a digital camera. And I believe it was in the late seventies. Um, and there's even a quote in the article that's sort of someone saying along the lines of, yeah, that's cool, but we're never going to need that. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and, and now you look and everyone has, you know, I have a, a professional quality camera on my iPhone, right? Mm, I mean, yeah. it's a totally different world these days. And so I really wanted to, put the brakes on and say, okay, emergency managers, we're, we gotta make sure we're starting from the same point and we also have to make sure we're going in the same direction. So for week two, the focus was creation. 
And that was really taking this initial understanding we had of the problem space and of emergency management and exploding it out and looking at it from other angles. I gave the example earlier of the public schools emergency manager who's considering what life is like for the aviation emergency manager, um, the FEMA, you know, federal presidential declaration level emergency manager or coordinating officer even, you know, and have them consider the perspective of a new emergency manager who's just coming into the field or someone who works in social services who, who is actually an emergency manager, even though that's not part of their job responsibilities. If they have a response role, I would argue that they're part of emergency management. So we really tried to extend our understanding of the field in the second week. Mm -hmm. And so Go ahead. I'm sorry. Do you have a question? No, no, no I'm just okay. agreeing with you. Okay. The third week where we really focused on development was drilling down into the notes we already had. And so what we sort of decided as a group is that 95, and of course this is an estimate, but about 95% of what emergency managers do is administrative. It's not the sexy 511 tactical pants, you know, headlamp, it's not the way not, Hollywood makes it seem. Right? It's not, it's yeah. not that it's not the sexy version of emergency management. Most of what we are doing is integrated risk management. That, that's it. Mm-hmm. We are helping our communities or wherever we work as an emergency manager, um, reduce the risk that we have to existing hazards um, and make sure that as we move forward as an organization, once we've reduced that risk or mitigated that risk, that we don't allow it to become a risk again. Right. We, we right. have to have that memory that not everybody has, especially in a local government where there are people, there's a lot of turnover, there's a lot of new initiatives and there's a political element to everything. Right. But we have to have that memory that says, well, seven years ago when we tried to build this new building, we didn't because of X, Y and Z local hazard. We have to keep that memory alive and we have to keep advocating for integrated risk management across all of our organizations. And to make someone really good at integrated risk management, what we identified was that there were three main skills that you needed to have. So you need to be an excellent project manager or be in the process of learning how to be a better project manager. Now, when we say project manager, are we talking uh, along the lines of um, uh, project management institute, project manager, that kind of a a background where you've got risk, risk management, issue management, change management, stakeholder management, communications, you know, all that kind of thing? um, That's a great question. So when you originally said that, I was thinking like, do I want to hire someone who has a PMP for this job, the project management professional Mm -hmm. certification? I think people who are PMPs would be fantastic emergency managers. Absolutely fantastic. I don't, when I talk about integrated risk management, I don't mean necessarily the PMP's inception of risk management, which is a highly, uh, uh, okay, to me okay. is highly specific yeah, yeah. and business-based or, or, or uh, more business case-based rather than emergency management, which is more just, you know, life safety, protecting property in the environment perspective. Right. So you've got to be a project manager. You've got to be a really good problem solver. And then you also have to be a great educator and a great trainer because half of what we're doing is educating people. I know when, mm-hmm. you know, people say, oh, I'm going to go do a, a tabletop exercise, right? And, and we're, it's an exercise. It's part of HCEEP. We're going we're gonna to be really, sorry, HCEEP is the Homeland Security Exercise and Evaluation Program. That's the FEMA standard for doing exercises. Um, an exercise is a learning opportunity. More than anything, I would say. Not only are you introducing people to emergency management and sort of the way we think of things and the way we process things, right? Because there's so many standardized documents that should be used for an exercise. But it's also a great opportunity for people to learn about their community or their organization or whichever group is exercising to learn about how that organization works and how that organization will respond to and recover from an emergency. And so I think being, being an educator or a trainer is such an essential part of being an emergency manager. But so that's, that's 95% of our time. And I'm sure that there are some, pay, some, some listeners who are going to say, well, you know, <laughs> I'm an emergency manager for the sexy stuff. And my reaction to that would be, you know, go forth and do good things. But also that's only about 5% of what we do. Mm-hmm. Almost everything we do is administrative and preparedness. And then what, we, what happens when there is an incident where there is an event, 
that's when we have to spring into action. But the steps we're taking are the same steps. The only difference is to be a good emergency manager, there is something just like first responders have it where the hotter the room you're in gets or the the more the building you're on catches on fire, the calmer you get. Yeah, you're so gonna be killed. Yeah. Yes, we have to do integrated risk management when people's life safety is at risk, when people's homes and property are at risk, when the environment's at risk, oftentimes when the people who have to respond, it's their home, it's their community, it's their family, mm-hmm. right? So as an emergency manager, you need to have all of those administrative skills, and then you need to be able to continue conducting and performing them under all hazards. And, and to make an emergency manager a really good emergency manager, you have to have that skill to lower the energy or lower the temperature in the room when it gets really stressful. What so, about, what about uh, you, because you mentioned you know, you're having groups and discussions, there's 18 to 20 people, maybe more, maybe less sometimes. Um, would a good emergency manager also have to be a good communicator because they've got multiple stakeholders too during, during real situations, you know, that 5% where you actually are, you know, lamp on, on the head and the yeah. neon vests and things, you know, is that something that they should also be able to do? So I think definitely, and I think I would characterize that under education and training. So that is the general sort of event to me, that seems like the general evangelism we need to be doing as emergency managers all the time, because Mm -hmm. if people think of us as the ones doing the, you know, the incident response or sort of the, as we've been saying, the sexier stuff, they're not going to understand why we're there because we do that such a small amount of the time. How do we justify our expense, frankly, certainly in local governments. I know the local government I worked in, half of the department was grant funded, right? Not even funded by the jurisdiction. So how do you, how do we justify ourselves? And I think there needs to be an ongoing individual, essentially PR campaign that we're launching Mm -hmm. in our organizations to really advocate and evangelize for ourselves, because what we do is really, really important. It's it's interesting that you just defined it that way, because that's the same, uh, arguments uh, or uh, points made, I should say, uh, by business continuity professionals trying to show their value. How do, how do we let people know how important we are and what we do and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's interesting that you almost said verbatim what people in my industry say. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I think it's true. I think it's, it's true for, for both groups. I mean, we live in a problem space or we work around a problem space that people don't like to focus on. It's, 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 and I get that. That's totally Mm -hmm. fine. Everybody else, you guys don't need to live in, in my world, right? Like my, my responsibility as an emergency manager is to be as considerate and thoughtful and intentional as I can for planning for the hazards um, and the threats that face whatever community organization I'm representing at the time, or I'm, I'm working to protect at the time. And so I think it's, it's essential to have the kinds of relationships with people to be successful in those situations. And one of the th- ways we've talked about this in the innovation hubs is through direct and indirect leadership. Mm-hmm. Emergency managers don't have a lot of opportunities for direct leadership. Um, we are people who advise politicians, we advise policymakers and decision makers, but we ourselves aren't necessarily that. Our job is, and I love this, one of the group participants shared this with us, that we're librarians. We know where all the books are. We don't know what's in them, but I can help you find. Do you need that book about ancient Greece? I can help you find that. I can get you the most detailed, specific, unique information <laughs> about some pothole down the road that you, I can get you every piece of information on that. I can't tell you what it means, but I can get it for you. Mm-hmm. And so we're librarians and that we sort of know where everything is. And if you extend or sort of apply the emergency operations center theory to the librarian concept, we keep the, we keep the emergency operations center running. So we have the internal policies and procedures that we pull from the National Incident Management System, other best practices, other guidance from FEMA about how to run an emergency operations center. And I would argue that emergency managers maintain their librarian role in that concept as well, because we set up the reporting requirements and the information distribution requirements and sort of have that administrative role again over the Mm -hmm. emergency operations center. 
back to the innovation hub. We talked about uh, discovery, create, and develop. Um, what about the last one to get us back to close that loop off? See, I told you we'd go off script. That's true. Did I and tell you before you. we started recording? It always you did. Happens. And well, thank you for bringing me back to that. <laughs> so, what's, we, so what's the last one? Refine. Refine. We haven't had the session yet. It's coming up this weekend. Um, we are going to take sort of all the concepts that we've played with and, and thought through during the past three sessions. And we're going to decide, do we even need a new definition? I'm, I'm not committed to throwing this one out. I'm just saying, let's, let's evaluate it and see if it serves us as, as best as it can for the next five to 10 years. And with the intent of wanting to draw and recruit new people into the field. So we are going to have a collaborative discussion. I think ultimately we might come out with two or three different definitions, but in the end, we're going to have a good sense of what should be there and what shouldn't be there. And then from there, me, along with the other planning team members for the Innovation Hubs project, we're going to take the data, process it, clean it, go through it, and then ultimately produce a journal article or a medium article about the process that we went through, as well as our findings and our results and what we hope people will take from this effort that we put together. That was going to be my very next question. What are you going to do after you have settled on maybe one or two different definitions? What are going to be the next steps outside of maybe publishing in a, in a journal? You know, how are you going to get that message out there to a, a wider audience? And how are you going to, or any thoughts yet, because maybe this is a little too far because you haven't had your session, as you said, get people on board to adopt that new definition? Yeah, that is going to be a more uphill battle. Um, I don't know if, I don't know how many people are, are using a standardized definition of emergency management who work in the field in the same way someone might in the medical field. Like, I'm, I don't work in the medical field, obviously, but like I have a very good idea of what a nurse does. Maybe not technically, but I know what their role is and what their mission is and what their objective is. And the same with the doctor. They have different roles, missions, and objectives, but I'm familiar with them. I understand the differences and I know who to go to to solve a problem I have, depending on the problem. Right. But that's not the case in emergency management. So if I could wave my magic wand, which is a concept I, I use commonly, which is if you could have it any way you wanted it, how would you have it? And that's really the standard I like people to set when I'm talking about them, talking with them about something creative or collaborative is if you could have it any way you wanted, how would it be? What is the best way to do it? And then let's find our way back to that in a practical world, in a real world. And so I say that only to point out that, um, there is a great opportunity to really socialize this and to field mm -hmm. test it and to get it out there as much as we can. And I think as the Emergency Management Growth Initiative grows both in size as far as participants and team members, um, and certainly as it grows in influence, which I have no doubt that it will, certainly under Lorraine's leadership and her experience with Disney um, and her professional capabilities, we are just seeing the start of it. Um, I can't reveal too much more than that um, as far as uh, the organization as a whole. But uh, as far as the definition, I think this is something that needs to be talked about more. And I hope that in, in the future, as um, additional conferences come up, that we'll have the opportunity to speak more about this and to have a more collaborative conversation. I don't think that this group of 15 to 18 individuals we put together in a Zoom room is the end-all be-all of the definition for emergency management. I think it's the first start. I think it's us moving in the right direction, but I think by shining a lens of diversity and inclusion on this definition, which really was not there previously, mm -hmm. um, I think it will do two things. I think it will the more we can get it out there and in the public, more people are going to see it and they're going to start to sort of say to themselves, oh, I am an emergency manager. I am a helper. I am a person who helps people on what is probably one of the worst days of their lives. So or I am even in career manager. development, I could be one. I could go in that direction. Yeah. Or I could go in that direction. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hmm. And secondly, I think what's really important is that we reposition ourselves within the field to be or within incident response, recovery, preparedness, and mitigation 
to be helpers that focus not just on supporting the majority of the population, but making sure that everyone underneath that, everyone who might need extra help, who might have a disability, right? That's a huge part of the population. Um, someone who might need extra help, we need to really focus on how to get services and to support to those people in addition to the bulk of the population. And so by having a more diverse and inclusive definition, I think that can help us move in that direction. But that's, those are my, that's my two cents. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> on that note, we've come to the end of our second segment. We are talking about emergency management today with Emily Jane Zaradine, and we will be right back. Welcome back. We are talking emergency management today with Emily Jane Zaradine. Emily Jane, lots of great information. I really liked uh, what you're doing in, with the Innovation Hub, and I, I wish you and your team all the success. When you guys meet the weekend, uh, on this weekend coming up, tell them, you know, pass along my, my goodwill and uh, have my fingers crossed for all of you on where that goes in the future. And I definitely hope to see that on LinkedIn and, you know, journals and other things as well. So all the best to everybody on that. Thank you. I appreciate that. So let's change gears a little bit now, which uh, this is an interesting piece that uh, you wanted to touch on. And uh, when I read it, I thought, hmm, I took a step back going, how does that work a little bit? But uh, then I thought, no, no, this is a really interesting topic. How does cybersecurity work within emergency management? Why should that be a concern? That's a great question. So 90% of critical infrastructure in the United States is privately owned and operated. 90%. That's a huge amount of our electrical grid, our natural gas pipelines, our fuel pipelines, our, you name it, anything that we rely on, water, wastewater treatment systems, all of that, or 90% of that is privately owned and operated. And so that's fine. I think there could be more regulations around those organizations as far as cyber reporting responsibilities. But what happens when there's a catastrophic water outage? What happens when the impacts from the critical infrastructure outage are so severe that they trigger an event, they trigger a disaster or an emergency or a crisis in a, in a region or in a part of the country? And this is might seem very specific, but I uh, was a student at the Center for Homeland Defense and Security, uh, which is part of the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. And part of my responsibilities as a student in that program was to produce a thesis. And so I produced a thesis called Beyond the First 48, Incorporating Non-Traditional Stakeholders into Incident Response Operations. And the whole thesis focuses on what do you do if you're not a first responder? And I define first responder as law enforcement and the fire service and EMS. What if you're not fire law or EMS? How do you integrate into incident response? And usually that's in an EOC, oftentimes that's in an EOC and people can come together in person and talk and communicate. And that's really great and helpful. But if you're a cyber incident responder, you don't necessarily have any understanding or any skills or really awareness <clears throat> of the incident response system or of <clears throat> the, you know, incident command and how that works. So while let's say there's a catastrophic water outage in a metropolitan region, there are a lot of people working to resolve that issue, but the people who are the most expert or even specialist in it, the cyber incident responders themselves, they need to be able to speak and interact with and interface with the local jurisdiction or the organization that is responsible for providing those critical services to the public. And so that is where I think there needs to be a bridge built. If you're a cyber incident responder, you are highly technical, very aware of what you're doing. Like you gotta be real sharp to do that job, but that doesn't necessarily correlate to the skills that you need to be an emergency manager. It's just sort mm -hmm. of apples and oranges and that's fine. But as we move forward and as the critical infrastructure that we have in the United States becomes more and more vulnerable to cyber attacks, as we saw with the gas pipeline, as we saw, uh, I was reading an article earlier today about the meat processing plant that just yeah. paid $11 million in ransom. I mean, if you've got a company that can, can throw out $11 million and it's not a big deal, by all means, 
maintain whatever cyber infrastructure you'd like. If you can do that, that's fine. But if you're an organization that can't do that and you provide an essential service to the public, then you need to be doing a lot more work as far as getting your IT team ready to interface with local incident responders. I think that's really essential. And I know that's something that even can dovetail into other parts of the conversation we've had offline, which is how important is it to train your employees? Mm-hmm. Well, that, that bridge, some, some people would call that, that's the crisis manager or the crisis management professions role. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think it's both to a certain extent. And, and I think it's unique to cyber incident responders just because they are mm-hmm. fundamentally speaking a different language. They're talking, in, you know, they're talking code, they're talking about programs, they're talking about strategies and things that are so specialized. It would be an equivalent of if I went into an operating room with a doctor and started to have a conversation and say, let me know what's going on here so I can figure yeah. out how to help you. Yeah. And that's I, necessarily- I've been in meetings like that with uh, uh, security people and you know, sometimes you really, it is like being in a different world and I'm not knocking security people. Don't, right. don't, no, it's, nobody it's sends just... an email. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, you, they are very uh, specialized and have their own uh, language, so to speak. Yeah. And I, and, and they also were there protecting proprietary information because these critical infrastructure oper- owners and operators are there for a profit as their bottom line, rather than as a public good, they have different interests that they're trying to protect. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's so important for traditional emergency management incident responders to be able to bridge that gap and have a conversation. I don't need to know how you guys do all of your proprietary work, but I do need to know not just what the restoration time is, but more details about the attack, more details about the cascading impacts. It's going to take you a week to rebuild the infrastructure. I need to know that, but I also want to hear that from the person who's in charge of it, if I'm the incident commander. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned, uh, before I jumped in there with a question, uh, about training employees on emergency management. Do you have any comments or suggestions, tips on that? Because, you know, during the break, you and I had a quick chat there about training, and it's always a challenge. It really is. And it's... um, I think it's as, as the world becomes more um, unstable in some ways, as far as weather is concerned, you know, migration patterns that are changing geographical borders or, you know, geographical borders that are becoming irrelevant because of climate change and things along those lines, as we have more severe fire, you know, fires in California and out West, as we have more severe, you know, tornadoes and hurricanes in the East, um, emergencies and disasters and making sure that you are prepared to respond to them is an individual responsibility. Mm-hmm. I think the government has a responsibility and a role. Absolutely. And they take that job very seriously, but I think there's an individual responsibility that needs to be incorporated into people's lives more. And I think a lot of that can be done through business organizations is through the company that you work for. Um, if I could wave, as I said before, wave magic wand and have it work out however I wanted it to, I would make every employee who goes through, um, you know, cybersecurity awareness training, or HR sensitivity training, I'd like them to take a 30 minute video on personal preparedness. Basic stuff, mm-hmm. you, you know, have some water around, have food, you know, if you have medications, make sure you have a 14 day supply of those. If you have a pet, make sure you have things for your pet. Make sure you have pet food. You, you're accounting for water for them. Simple things like that, that ultimately can help those who's fit, who are as individuals and as with their families experiencing disasters can help them get back to zero faster. And by getting back to zero faster and being able to take care of themselves, they can then go out and help people in the community who can't take care of themselves, who need that extra help or that mm-hmm. extra set of hands. And so I think if we can really get that information out in a massive way to people, we can do so much to help first responders and to help emergency managers really redirect their focus to people who need our help the most. Yeah, I think one of the problems with that is, is a lot of people still think, even after COVID, you know, disasters, they'll happen to somebody else. You know, we watch the news and it's always somewhere else, another city, another state, another country. You know, uh, it doesn't happen here, but it does. It's just, you know, your turn is coming. Yeah. You know, and people don't like to think of that. And it, let's face it, you know, who wants to think on a daily basis that a disaster is heading your way? 
Right. You know, <laughs> nobody oh, really. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. My parents live in Northern California and I worry all the time, every time it's not raining there, which is almost all of the time that their house is going to burn down because it almost did twice during different wildfires. Oof. So it's, it's, it's a mindset that some people are okay living with and other people just can't process it or bring it into their mind at all. <clears throat> and so it's about finding and building a more about building a culture of resilience and building a culture of preparedness where these types of conversations and considerations are normalized. Last question. Yeah. How has COVID impacted the emergency management field in your thoughts or in experiences? I, I think it has dramatically. So I ran the emergency operations center for Arlington, Virginia for the first 60 days of the COVID response. Um, after that, I got my team set up and I said, all right, I'm, I'm going out on my own. And then I went and worked with New York City for several months. Um, so in those experiences, I think COVID has dramatically changed how emergency managers operate. Um, I don't think anyone, I mean, frankly, I, I think everyone sort of always thought there's not going to be anything so bad that I'm not going to be able to call my neighbors. Or if I can't call my neighbors for help, there's going to be someone on the other side of the country whose team is not impacted by this in the way that my team is, and they can come and help us. We have incident <clears throat> management teams across the country as organized by FEMA that are intended to do that. Mm -hmm. We didn't see coming that every would, everyone would be equally tapped and impacted by this hazard. So what, what that means to me about the future of emergency management is it makes me very concerned because I know that people who have been working in EOCs, EOC level shift work, which is, you know, 12 hours, seven days a week. I know people who have been working incredibly intensively doing important work for 15, 16, 17 months now. I mean, mm -hmm. I know some jurisdictions started really in earnest planning for COVID in January of 2020. We started a few weeks after that, but um, this is in the same way that I think COVID will be a cornerstone of change for the medical field. I think it may be for emergency management as well. And that's why the timing for the innovation hubs is so important because I want to get that new definition out there. So as people are identifying that, you know what, this isn't the field for me, I'm burned out. I either need to take time to rest and recover or find a new pathway for myself professionally. I want to, I want people to say, I went through COVID and I didn't get to help enough. And I want yeah. to help more. And that's yeah. who I want in our field for the next 20 years. Yeah, that's going to happen in the, any, anyone in resilience, uh, incident management, business continuity management, any of them. I think uh, it, COVID is going to be a cornerstone for, well, dozens and dozens of professions, I think, one way or another. It's going to definitely make some big changes down the road. So we only have a, a minute or two left. Do you have any final thoughts? Um don't. I want to thank you so much for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. It has been lovely to talk with you. And I, um, as I've said to the Innovation Hubs group, any opportunity for me to nerd out about emergency management, I'm there. So <laughs> it's, I mean, it's true. This is my passion and it's my hobby. So um, if there's anything else I can do to support you or your show, please don't hesitate to let me know. I'd love to be back. Great. Um, then the door is open. We just need to figure out a topic and uh, we'll get you back for sure. Emily Jane, I really appreciate your uh, time sharing with us today. It was really good. And uh, I hope a lot of people in emergency management pay attention to this. And even people not in emergency management really pay attention to this, you know, of where the industry is going. You know, we do have to work together. We've got to get rid of these. I'm in cyber silo. I'm in business continuity silo. I'm in emergency management silo. I think, you know, we're at a point we've got to work together. And it's nice to talk to someone who's very passionate about what they do, because obviously you are. Comes across very clear. <laughs> so thank you once again for your time. I really appreciate it. And to everyone who's watching and listening, stay prepared, everybody. If you liked that video, thumbs up. If you didn't like that video, thumbs down. But leave a message and let me know what your thoughts are. If you'd like to be a guest on the show to talk about something related to business continuity, disaster management, COVID, personal well-being, anything that's relatable to those subjects, you can reach me through my LinkedIn profile, which is in the video description. And of course, don't forget to subscribe. In the meantime, stay prepared, everybody.